Um, if you ask me what I'm most proud of is the fact that civil society organizations put a very spirited fight, uh, both at the national level and at the regional level and the international level. Initially, the level of understanding on, on how the agreement should look like was at its lowest. And the struggles and the fights that the uh, CSOs and, and trade unions and, and other um, the farmers, uh, workers put up, for me, it's something that I, I will always carry along and it's something to be proud of. For the, the EPA thing, the first thing that I think is a moment of some satisfaction is the fact that the EPA, when it was launched in 2000, there was a deadline of 2007 to conclude it. And by 2004, everybody thought that it was going to be concluded. And I think that we managed as a civil society to actually make sure that the EPA didn't meet this deadline. At the very least. So we are still negotiating it until 2003. 14, so it was civil society's contribution. But before that, uh, I think the greatest moment of, of coming to age, what now civil society and our collaborative is Seattle, when African, has African ministers uh, responded to some of the, of the desires and edges of civil society organizations, as well as organizations like CRTV and Deborah Network, actually abandoned the negotiations in Seattle and refused to go in pulling along. And I came into this struggle in 1999 Seattle, you know, and that was a baptism of fire. But since then, the struggle for me has been exciting because what I have realized is that if we work together, we can give a very huge punch to the empire. I saw this for me, the highest point was in Cancun, where civil society, um, our negotiators, members of parliament, you know, were all together saying no. Because there are four new issues. There are four um, issues, investment, competition, policy, trade facilitation, and government procurement. Now these people are saying, at the same time, negotiate two issues, you know. And I remember the, um, uh, Martin Coe saying, but you can't say that it is about poison, you know, that you take some little poison, we don't want. <laughs> and I remember um, the minister from Zambia, what was his name? Patel. Patel. Patel saying, we don't want. So he says, now what are we going to do? Are we going to tell them that the conference has collapsed? Patel said, exactly, you have said it. Everybody said, yes, yes, it has collapsed. We just couldn't believe it. We went out, we started dancing, and, you know. But what I'm saying really, that if we are together, you know, if we move together, policy makers, civil society, government, we can be able to do it. We can say no, and we can be able to do whatever we, we want. I think for me the most challenging has been uh, winning over government. Uh, for example, when we started the EPA struggle, I remember when they initiated the EPA, yes, they never told us, we just went on, on TV, um, then we sat and came up with a very strong statement. But our statement, we are looking at specific issues. And for that, it has this challenge. These are the implications. You know, very, very good technical, uh, technical analysis. And we put it in the newspapers. The Ministry of Trade put their response in the newspapers abusing us, we are what, we don't, we don't want development, and this was a watershed in our, our work with the Ministry of Trade. When negotiations started, all the issues were, which we, we had raised at the one switch government took off, and that was, it was a challenge, you know, winning over, you know, but after that, you know, things started running smoothly because the issues we had raised are the very issues which they raised when they were 
telling the European Union that we need to be negotiating on these issues? Uh, I think our governments uh, crumbled under pressure. The negotiation is not about logic and facts, the negotiation is about power. And that takes the second challenge of the other side. That the civil society, we're very good as civil society NGOs, we build relationships huh, where our arguments were solid. But we didn't build relationships with workers, we didn't build relationships with domestic producers, we didn't build relationships with women traders. In other words, we didn't build relationships with social constituencies whose political muscle we will have mobilized as a counterweight. And I think that that, that, that that failure of building knowledge around the policy questions that affect the people as they live their daily life as an instrument of mobilizing them was the greatest failure of our campaign. And that means again, I will start from there. I saw so that one inside strategy, because I remember we teachings like this one. Because to convince, to mobilize outside, you, you need to break down the EPS to, to understand this is how they are linked to gender, to labor, to environment, you need that. And we are able to understand the issues, to have conviction, because you need to understand them. So, so you find that after our generation, we don't have a younger, you know, I have a generation who are grounded in the issues, who can be able to, to talk to the, our, our negotiators, you know, to be able to talk the technical issue, but also be able to go and mobilize the women, the producers, the SMEs. There is that missing link there, I think, which we need to, you know, to engage on. Uh, the, the other issues on parliamentarians and mobilizing also the students is also very critical. Uh, personally, I attended the first ever meeting as a student at McKerry. We mobilized ourselves, uh, Siatini, who passed by the table. They came to the hall, big hall, we had all the students from political science, law students, economic students, and we had a different view of how international agreements are negotiated and made. We had a different angle away from the theories and macroeconomic theories of Marxist theories and all those kinds of theories. And for me, that was at the beginning of the journey. And if this is sustained in all the partner states, you're likely to build a movement of students and thinkers who are able to consistently follow uh, these processes beyond negotiators and beyond academicians and beyond the civil society. And when we talk about the Africa about CAFTA, when we talk about WTO, the rendezvous clause in the EPS, at the end of the day we are talking about structural transformation, rural transformation, you know, how do we build our economies, you know, for me that I think that should be the beginning point, you know, so what kind of policy framework do we need out there? What kind of relationship do we need with the European Union for us to be able to industrialize? What kind of capital do we need for us to be able to industrialize? So I think that's uh, the way forward.